Hello everyone, this lesson is about stress and strain in the materials topic. You'll be able to define and calculate stress and strain. You'll also understand why stress and strain are used rather than force and extension. We'll be looking at stress strain graphs and identify materials uh, properties from its stress strain graph. Quick starter, think about the pros and cons of using K as a measure. So K, remember, is the spring constant, and it's found from the gradient of the force extension graph. What might be a, um, a good thing about that, and what might be potentially a problem? So it is relatively straightforward to measure. We need a force and an extension, and from that we can get a value of K. K equals F over X. Um, and it gives us a measure of the stiffness of a material. So it's a useful measure. But a disadvantage is that it will change with the dimensions of a sample. So we could have the same material, but different sizes, different dimensions, lengths and thicknesses, and we get different values of K for each one. So it's not a material property, so it's going to be more useful for us if we can find a measure of stiffness which is a material property. So a quick bit of revision, F equals KX from Hooke's law, K equals F over X. So how will K vary if we have a longer sample? And how will K vary if you have a sample with a larger cross-sectional area? So a longer sample will be less stiff and K will decrease we get more extension for the same load. If we have a sample with a, a larger cross-sectional area, K will increase, it becomes stiffer, and we get less extension for the same load. Try sketching force extension graphs to show two K values, one for a long thin sample, and two for a short fat sample of the same material. Pause the video to have a go at that. So the short fat material has a high value of K and therefore is shown as a steep gradient on the FX graph. A long thin sample has a low K, low stiffness, and is shown as a lower gradient on the FX graph. So a key term for this lesson, stress. So to allow comparison between different, material, different samples of a material, we use stress and strain rather than force and extension. Stress equals applied force divided by cross-sectional area. Can be written as sigma equals F over A. So what will the units be of stress? The unit of stress is newtons per meter squared or pascal. One newton per meter squared is equal to one pascal. You may recall the unit of pascal from pressure, and pressure is also equal to force divided by area. But stress is specifically used when we're talking about applying either tensile or compressive forces to materials. Worked example, a wire has a diameter of 0.66 millimeters and a force of 90 newtons is applied. What is the stress? What assumptions have you made? So I'd like you to set your working out very clearly and calculate stress from the information given. Pause the video to do that. So diameter equals 0.66 millimetres. So radius equals 0.33 millimetres, which equals 3.3 times 10 to the minus 4 metres. Area, cross-sectional area, equals pi r squared, which equals 3.42 times 10 to the minus 7 metres squared. So it's pi times 3.3 times 10 to the minus 4 squared. And F we know equals 90 newtons given in the question. So then we can use our equation for stress. Stress equals force over area, which equals 90 newtons divided by 3.42 times 10 to the minus 7 meters squared, which equals 2.63 times 10 to the 8 pascal. Assumptions we've made, the wire is cylindrical and the ultimate tensile stress is not exceeded.
in these questions you need to show your working very clearly particularly make sure that you write down your calculation of the cross-sectional area separately uh, before doing the force divided by area calculation this is to avoid mistakes in your working the unit of uh, stress we said was Pascal we could also write Newton's per meter squared as an appropriate unit strain which is the other key definition for this lesson strain equals extension over original length can be written as epsilon equals delta x over x so remember from your uh, force extension experiments that you were doing you were measuring the extension of the spring to calculate the strain we would take that extension and divide it by the original length of the spring or the piece of material whatever it was we were stretching so what are the units of strain because strain is a ratio it actually has no units so long as we've got the extension and original length in the same unit so meters or millimeters then the units essentially cancel out and um, strain has no units we need to be aware that uh, we can be given strain as a percentage. For example, a strain of 0.1%, what would that equal as a decimal fraction? So we take our 0.1% and divide it by 100, and that would give us a strain as a decimal value, which is 0.001. So this is one to look out for in questions and on graph axes, as we'll see. Worked example. A wire of length 1.5 metres extends by 5.2 millimetres. What is the tensile strain? So identify the values from the question. So the original length is 1.5 metres. The extension is 5.2 millimetres, which is 5.2 times 10 to the minus 3 metres. So now have a go at calculating the strain. So we divide extension by original length, 5.2 times 10 to the minus 3 metres, divided by 1.5 metres, and we get 3.5 times 10 to the minus 3. And remember, there's no units of strain. It's useful to be able to plot a stress against strain graph because it allows us to identify a material and the material's properties when under load. Note that we get the same shape uh, stress strain graph as we would get if we plotted force against extension for a particular material sample. So what, what material could this possibly be? Look at the graph, identify uh, some properties that the material has and think about what the material could be from that. So why do we bother plotting stress against strain? Why not just have force extension graphs? So the point is the values of stress and strain for a particular material do not change with sample dimensions and so we are identifying material properties. So it's a property of copper that it has a particular elastic limit stress uh, or it has a particular um, breaking stress um, or a particular fracture uh, point stress um, those values are helpful to know if we're making a structure with a particular material um, and they, they are independent of the dimensions of the sample So just a, a reminder, we talked before about the elastic limit when we looked at the force extension graph. The elastic limit, which is sometimes called the yield point, is the point in which behaviour changes. It's the stress in which point in which behaviour changes from elastic to plastic, meaning that at that point and beyond, the material will no longer return to its original shape when the load is removed but will undergo some plastic behaviour which will lead to a permanent deformation of the material. 
ultimate tensile stress is the stress, uh, the maximum stress that the material can withstand, um, and uh, the material having withstood that stress would then be weakened and would have a lower fracture point. So it would actually fracture and break at a lower stress once the uh, ultimate tensile stress has been applied to it. So if we take uh, the plastic deformation uh, a little bit further now, if stress is applied to a material so it goes beyond the elastic limit, um, this particular material has, let's say, has reached, the stress has been applied so that a strain has taken it to point C on the graph, then if the load is then removed, um, what we can see is that the material will um, reduce in, uh, in terms of its extension, um, but it, it won't go back down to zero extension when the load is fully removed. What will happen is it will go down this dotted line and at zero stress, it would now have a permanent deformation so in other words, it's now got a permanent value of strain, even with no load applied. In fact, if you then applied the uh, load, the stress again, um, you could go up that dotted line as well, back to point C. So the material is still displaying some kind of springiness um, and some kind of uh, similar behaviour to, to what it had before. It's just doing it from a new um, longer um, starting point. So let's have a look at stress strain graphs for different materials. Sketch the four graph lines and label with the correct description from the four shown here. A ductile material, a plastic material, a brittle material and a strong material which is not ductile. So I'd like you to pause the video and spend a few minutes doing this. So this shows the four materials now labelled on the graph. So the brittle material is elastic up to the point at which it fractures. It then uh, doesn't have, it doesn't show any plastic behaviour. The red line, a strong material which is not ductile. So we can say it's strong because it reaches a high value of stress before fracturing, but it's not ductile because it doesn't have uh, these large uh, strain values that the others have. The green one is a ductile material, so this is similar to the graph we were looking at uh, previously. So it's able to reach uh, quite large strain values and this is a typical shape for uh, a stress strain graph for a ductile material. The purpley colour one there shows a plastic material, so it shows large values of strain for relatively low values of stress, and it's changing its shape permanently, and so uh, wouldn't return to its original shape when the, the stress was removed. So how would we measure stress and strain? So we'd have a setup similar to the one shown in the diagram here. If we were using a material such as a metal, which is really quite a stiff material, we'd need to make the wire long and thin. Making it thin means we've got a small cross-sectional area. That's going to increase the stress value that we apply to the material for a given load. Making the wire long is going to mean that for a given strain we get measurable values of extension. If we had a very short wire we would only get very small extensions for that wire which might be very difficult to measure. So because it's a thin wire we need to use a micrometer to measure the diameter of the wire and from that calculate the cross-sectional area. We'd mark on the original length as shown with a letter L 
uh, it doesn't matter where we mark that original length we put a marker on as long as we don't change it we try and make it as long as possible probably by having the wire extending across the length of a bench we'd apply a load to give us a measurable extension and we record both the load in newtons and the extension in meters and then we can use our values to calculate stress and strain we'd be looking to see how much strain we got for a given stress applied and that starts to tell us about how the material responds under load the same apparatus will be used when we do the required practical to measure young modulus um, and so it's uh, just worth getting familiar with it now so I'd like you to check your learning from this lesson do you understand and calculate stress and strain could you define stress and strain Under, understand why stress and strain are used um, instead of force of extension identify properties of a material from its stress strain graph and define ultimate tensile stress and yield point so that's it folks um, I hope everyone is keeping well bye for now